All right, here we go. So it's a very good morning to you from a slightly cloudy San Francisco. We've had a lot of fires around here lately, but we're all fine. Uh, we're all breathing fresh air this morning, and we're ready to go for, uh, for the latest Meraki quarterly. Uh, my name is Simon Thompson. look after product marketing here at Meraki, and I'm surrounded by an esteemed group of uh, product marketeers and product managers who are going to help take us through uh, some of the latest updates from Meraki. So thank you very much again for taking time out of your uh, day today. Let's have a look at the, uh, the general reminder of the, uh, the kind of way that we run these sessions. So uh, the Meraki Quarterly is targeted at established Meraki customers and partners. If you are brand new to Meraki, I definitely recommend that you uh, go ahead and sign up for one of our introductory webinars. This one is assuming that you kind of know this basic stuff already and you're already uh, well up to speed with what we do here at Meraki. So we're really here to uh, provide some of the latest information around some of the different products in the portfolio. As, as I said a moment ago, we are uh, presenting this uh, as a group of uh, product marketeers and guests as well. And what we tend to do with the Meraki Quarterly, it's based around the calendar quarters and we look back over that last quarter to really see uh, what are some of the interesting innovations that we've brought across the whole portfolio. And also a look at some of the new, brand new beta features that we can potentially uh, introduce you to and that you could try out for yourself on the equipment that you've gone for. Uh, this is a roadmap free zone, so we're not really talking about the future uh, here at Meraki. Uh, it's ever evolving, as I'm sure you're aware, day to day, week by week, uh, always new changes happening. But we're really focused on trying to bring you up to speed on anything you may have missed uh, over the last calendar quarter. So I'm going to kick off. Uh, with an update on the MX portfolio, our security appliance. And so let's have a look at some of the introductions that we made uh, during the last quarter. These are pretty big deals because uh, the security appliances were first launched in 2011, so pretty mature platform at this point in time. Uh, but we had a couple of platforms there which were starting to get a little bit long in the tooth in terms of uh, their sheer level of throughput they were capable of. What's been very interesting to watch over the past sort of five years or so is to see how uh, service providers have been really bringing prices down for internet connectivity at very high speeds. And so what we've started to see is that people are able to buy uh, very fast internet connections, like gig per second, for example, and we really need to be able to match that with uh, throughput on the security appliance when it is doing all the heavy lifting that it needs to do, uh, protecting end users through its firewalls, through its content filtering, through its malware protection, and so on. So these new models are really designed to address that evolving uh, service provider market. And so the 250 and 450, we're very proud to announce these uh, and very pleased with the kind of performance levels that we've been seeing going through them as well. One of the nice things about these platforms is the flexibility that you have around connectivity. So obviously they're not really designed to be used as uh, switches for connecting uh, end user clients, but you can see there that you have a choice of copper and fiber at both, both SFP and SFP plus levels. A lot of flexibility there for connecting into your local area network. As with all of our security appliances, the, the, uh, these, these particular models do support all of the same functionality you've seen before, and they're really the latest and greatest in terms of performance when you're applying some of those newer, uh, more heavy lift uh, security features that we've introduced like advanced malware protection and threat grid. You can see the throughput levels there on the screen as well. Obviously, always keep in mind that these figures are very hard to predict very accurately because uh, real world conditions do vary so much from one customer's use cases to the next. Uh, but what we're trying to do here is give a good indication, certainly how they compare with each other, uh, and also really to help you, uh, help guide you on making the correct selection. Also, as part of the same launch, we introduced the Meraki Z3. Uh, this is a really cute little device. If you've ever seen the Z1, you'll know exactly what it looks like because it's really identical in form factor. Uh, simply change the color to a very svelte looking uh, black there. And we've introduced an optional desk stand as well, so you can save space on your desk by mounting it vertically. As you can see, performance has been improved. Again, we're constantly trying to keep these platforms uh, current in terms of Wi-Fi capability, throughput capability. But you'll see that the recommended client count has not changed here. This device really is targeted at the teleworker, somebody who is typically working from home or typically working remotely, maybe needs to throw one of these in there when they're traveling. Uh, to give them just the basic connectivity for the few clients that they will need to connect. It's certainly not intended as 
an office device for a whole group of users. Uh, so do keep that in mind if you're looking at this. Obviously, this is the entry level from a price point perspective, but really is targeted at that smaller number of users. And the third very exciting announcement we made in the last quarter was the introduction of VMX for Azure. And it was only, I think, one quarter ago or maybe two quarters ago that uh, we were introducing Amazon Web Services through VMX. And just to recap what this is for those who are not familiar, uh, VMX is really a way to enable us to extend the benefits of Meraki's auto VPN technology uh, right into these public cloud services that people are increasingly moving their IT services across to. Amazon Web Services and Azure. And it was very entertaining to watch what happened when we announced uh, AWS support, uh, but when we launched that back in, I think it was around May time, uh, there was immediately a whole raft of questions. I remember them in the quarterly that we ran at the time, uh, saying, hey, where's, when's Azure coming? The good news is we were already working on it at that time, and we've now taken it over the finish line, so it's available to you. Last thing I want to update you on on the MX is just a couple of features which are available in beta that you can now try out. Uh, and always, when we, whenever we announce any of these, the way to actually make it real is to pick up the phone, speak to either your sales contact or Meraki support. Uh, they can get you set up with these capabilities so you can try them out in your own environment. I think the most exciting one here is load monitoring. I mentioned earlier that we have to remain uh, always aware of how much load we're putting on these security appliances. When you look at the sheer range of capabilities that they have uh, available to them, if, if uh, an end user like yourselves switches all of that on, that's clearly going to be hitting the CPU and the processing capability of that MX pretty hard. So what we want to do is, pr is provide guidance to the network operator around the kind of load that that MX is seeing on a scale of one, uh, zero to 100. And really the intent here, it's just really to see uh, what the trends look like and uh, to see how it compares maybe with what it looked like two or three months ago. You're gonna be able to therefore see that your use case is starting to push the box a little bit harder. So maybe it's time to start planning ahead to think about uh, maybe upgrading to a more powerful device to make sure that you don't run into problems with uh, maxing out your performance. In terms of uh, split DNS, fairly self-explanatory, but there are a lot of companies that like to uh, handle internal name resolution differently to uh, internet name resolution. And so we want to provide that capability to set those up separately. So intranet can have its own, maybe your own locally server, keep things nice and fast. But then out to the internet, you might choose to use a service like OpenDNS, which is obviously now uh, known as Cisco Umbrella. Uh, but that capability is very popular, and that type of capability is very popular. We want to be able to provide those alternate options running concurrently on the box. And then last but not least, BGP. We've mentioned this in the last couple of quarters. Uh, we're really working hard to, uh, to get this implementation right. Those of you who work with BGP will know it's pretty much about as complex as networking gets in terms of uh, setting up uh, and uh, interopering with uh, with different areas, that kind of thing. Uh, BGP is uh, is now functioning well on the MX, and we're very keen to get as many beta tests as we can for that platform, or for that uh, for that particular protocol. And so, if you are a BGP user or you're considering using that for your wide area network, uh, definitely do reach out to support, give it a try, and see how well it works out for you. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who's going to take us through an update on the security cameras. Hello, everybody. As Simon mentioned, my name is Rachel, and I am the PMM for our security camera line, MV. Uh, before I dive into these slides, I just wanted to make an announcement that this is essentially the one-year anniversary of our security cameras Woo! being available. So that is very exciting. Um, so with that, I'm going to give you a little personnel update. Obviously, the product has been growing really rapidly. We're really excited with the reception that we've had thus far. And so, of course, we need more people on our product team in order to keep up with the demand. So we've added Sarah Lynn to our um, lineup here, who is going to manage all of our channel um, partner relationships. So um, we, there, for those our partners, um, you know, look forward to having a lot more content. I know we have um, haven't been the best at, at keeping that all up to date, so Sarah Lynn is going to be totally on top of that. 
I also wanted to take a second to kind of look at some of the cool use cases we've seen over the past year coming out of our customers. So those of you who are lucky enough to have spoken with George, our product manager, have probably heard this um, a couple times now, but still very um, interesting and kind of a little funny and silly for those of you who haven't heard about it. Um, so we heard about this use case coming out of Australia. One of the government agricultural departments is actually using MVs out in the pasture to monitor sheep behavior patterns. You heard me correctly, sheep. So what we see um, is that they're using our motion search tools as well as our motion heat mapping to monitor where the sheep are grazing, what time of they're looking for shade, um, that kind of, I don't know what else you look for in terms of sheep behavior, but I assume there's a lot more um, complexity to it. Um, but this use case, although a little bit silly, is actually a really shining example of where MV, um, you know, really shines. So these cameras are, of course, deployed in fields where there's, you know, very little, if, if any bandwidth um, available. These are probably running on, you know, 4G uplinks out there in the field. And so these people aren't even concerned with the live video feed at all because they don't have enough bandwidth for that, but they're able to still access that, that analytics data um, because that is purely based on metadata that's stored in the cloud. So using just a couple of thumbnails and that relative uh, motion data, they're able to really easily and quickly see where the sheep have been. So we thought this was a really cool example of, um, you know, an unlikely use case for MV. And it really highlights sort of where we see the camera kind of moving in the future. This analytics, um, you know, aspect, although we only have the motion heat, map, motion heat mapping right now, um, this is where we see the product expanding in the future. So look forward to that. I also wanted to touch on something that is not new to the product. It's actually been built in from the very beginning, um, but I will take personal fault here in saying that we did not do a great job of um, highlighting this in the past. And so over the last year, I've been to tons of trade shows and whenever we bring up the network security aspect of the cameras, everybody's eyes light up. Um, and so I hope that this will be news to some of you and hopefully good news to some of you. So if we look at the global threat landscape in the past year, we've seen things like WannaCry, um, Petya, Nyatnya, I never know how to say that one correctly. Um, all of these global cyber attacks that have um, been coming through. And if we look at the part of the networking infrastructure that is most often attacked, it is of course the router. But the surprising fact is that the second most attacked part of the networking infrastructure is the NVR and the DVR. So that is the network video recorder or digital video recorder for those of you who are not in the know. And that's typical for a security camera deployment. It's basically an unsecured Windows machine, which makes it a huge gaping target for these types of cyber attacks. So I probably don't need to remind you, but the MV does not have an NVR, it does not have a DVR. And so we immediately take out that component of the risk. On top of that, those of you who have set up a security camera system before have probably dealt with self-signed certificates. So um, you can see here a couple of screen caps of what that looks like. Um, these, you know, tons of error messages. Um, you're probably familiar with this screen as well. You have to fight all of your best instincts and click to go through a page that tells you that it is not secure and that your connection is not private because the cert is self-signed. Um, Meraki has automated this process. We actually have our cameras purchase their certificates when they come online. It's a publicly signed cert. It's all automated. It's all included with your licensing and it's extremely secure. So you won't have to ever see the screen ever again. And of course, we would like to leave you um, in a position where you are not feeling like this. So hopefully the, uh, those of you who have had experience with the Meraki cameras know that this is a much better experience. And so all of these examples that I've highlighted on our one year anniversary, um, hopefully 
kind of just tie back to the main development principles that we have on the MV team. So cost reduction through architectural simplification, removing that NVR and DVR from your infrastructure, operational simplification through automation, getting rid of those manually self-signed um, SSL certs, and business value through intelligence, monitoring your sheep out in the field or whatever else you might need to monitor. And with that, I'll hand over to Emily. <coughs> All right, thanks, Rachel, appreciate it. I apologize in advance if you hear any hacking. Um, I'm back from the dead here. All right, so we had only a few small um, updates really for MR this past quarter. We're deep in development on some awesome big new things um, that's just coming up in the next couple of months. So uh, what we have here though uh, is actually fairly cool. Uh, if you do use your Meraki access points for their Bluetooth capability, and just as an aside, all of our newer quad radio access points have that integrated Bluetooth BLE radio that can both advertise and scan. If you are trying to use your Bluetooth um, in an integrated environment, uh, specifically using the advertising capabilities, we have some UI enhancements. Uh, so just a little bit of detail, right? You're going to use your beacons, uh, whether they are the Meraki access point or something like uh, an Estimote to uh, basically serve specialized content to users, right? Basically um, to interact with third-party mobile apps perhaps uh, on sort of a, a location-aware uh, type uh, uh, situation. And so what we can do now is actually if you go in your wireless Bluetooth settings uh, where it used to be sort of called advertising in the menu there, it's now called beaconing. And essentially what you can do now is set unique uh, minor numbers or unique minor IDs uh, for all of your access points. So essentially what's happening is when you have a beacon ID, right, it's made out of three components. You've got your UUID, which is typically there for sort of an org-wide identifier, and then you have your major ID, uh, which is typically, um, you know, down to, say, like a location level. So an example might be uh, a UUID would be, say, for target stores, and the major number might be for an individual store, and then you use your minor ID to sort of uh, pinpoint the location within that uh, geography. So what is happening here is that when you enable this unique uh, sort of setting, um, your access points will all get a unique minor number uh, and they will all be assigned to sort of a, your network will get a sort of, a sort of general major number and your APs will get a minor number. So that's going to actually help you get a little bit more granular information um, when you're doing uh, Bluetooth deployments. The other thing that I wanted to highlight uh, just briefly uh, is just to talk a little bit about the Meraki response <coughs> me, to the crack vulnerability. So if you haven't heard about this, this came out uh, earlier this week. Basically 10 new uh, attacks were uh, discovered that actually target the WPA2 protocol uh, in wireless. So it's not an attack that is vendor specific. Um, it's, cr it's across vendors, it's basically attacking uh, wireless itself. Um, so it does impact all modern protected wireless networks. And essentially what's happening is with these attacks, and there are 10 of them, 10 vulnerabilities that were discovered, um, basically uh, you know, machines are tricked into reinstalling uh, already in use encryption keys and that results in the potential to replay, decrypt, or forge packets. Now, across these 10 vulnerabilities, um, there's different levels of impact depending on the, the device type and operating system. So iOS and Macs uh, and Androids and Linux devices all sort of have various levels of impact here. And in general, for nine of these 10 vulnerabilities, you need to basically get a patch from your operating system vendor. So Microsoft is already in the lead here. They've issued a patch for their devices. We're still waiting for iOS and Macs, although Apple has said that they do have a patch in their current beta versions 
of software that should come out in the next couple of weeks. Um, particularly if you're Linux or Android, this could be very serious, uh, especially if you're running Android 6. So I would encourage you guys to definitely Google this if you haven't already. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that the one vulnerability that does impact wireless vendors um, that takes advantage of some weaknesses in the 802.11r protocol implementation, uh, Meraki has already gone ahead and issued patches for. So this is the one thing that we can fix because it does impact uh, specific vendor solutions and vendor implementations of this 11R protocol. And I wanted to highlight there is a blog post uh, on our blog right now detailing all of this in way more depth. Um, but if you are running uh, networks, generally speaking, if you update to the firmware version 2411, that should patch you. Otherwise, if you are running MR33s, 30Hs, or 74s in your deployments, you're going to also need uh, to make sure that you're running uh, firmware version 25.7. So I would just go check the blog post. There's a lot of links to some useful information um, and details there about how 11R works uh, and what we've done to, uh, to mitigate this. The one thing I will say is that if you want to just check really quickly to see if you do have 11R enabled for a given SSID, it's very easy. Just go to your access control page. Uh, and I've highlighted it down here in green at the bottom. Just select the SSID in question, uh, and you should see down there uh, whether or not it's enabled or disabled. All right, that's all we've got for the moment. So I'm going to hand it off to Patrick to talk about our enterprise mobility management. <laughs> all righty, everybody. My name is Patrick. I work on the product management team for Systems Manager. And we're going to kick things off with another fun vocabulary word. So any of you familiar with this space know that we love our three-letter acronyms. We started with MDM, Mobile Device Management, adding on additional management functionality like content, application, and identity to bundle that into Enterprise Mobility Management, or EMM. Uh, but we are now seeing a new term coming up in the industry, Unified Endpoint Management, or UEM, which is essentially taking the mobility portion out of EMM and as you know, Systems Manager has always supported Mac and Windows server desktop versions as well. So just something to be aware of there. Diving into new features, this last quarter we recently pushed out an update to the apps page. So this is more than just a UI facelift. facelift. There's actually several quality of life enhancements uh, embedded as well. So for example, scoping devices, you can now be more selective in specifying whether the that you want to push an application to are the ones that have just out-of-date ones, ones that are already installed, ones that aren't installed. So a little bit more granularity there. Some of the bigger features that are bundled in with this apps page refresh is the Mac App Store integration. So prior to this release, the only way to push software to uh, Mac devices was by uploading or building your own PKG or DMG files. With App Store integration, you can actually install applications, search it natively, uh, just as you can see in the screenshot here, like you would any Android or iOS application. And this also enables us to use VVP device assignment for Mac applications rather than just user-based, which is great for any of you out there that aren't using Apple IDs or aren't allowing your uh, employees or end users to sign into their own Apple ID. Another enhancement we've added to this page is the improved workflow, so the ability to import applications from VPP. So let's say that you have 100 applications in VPP on a particular systems manager network. You're only using 20 of those applications. Prior to the release of this page, you would need to manually search each application uh, just to, add, to configure and push that application out. Now you can import in bulk, set the scope, configure whether to use VPP licensing, and you're good to go. The next major feature is the do not disturb mode. So one common customer request that we get is, I would like to be able to schedule my applications and when they update. The real use case that we saw from a lot of conversations with customers there was that oftentimes it was more about, there are specific times where we don't want applications or profiles to install and interrupting my end users, especially in cases where you're using kiosk mode or single app mode to lock, for example, point-of-sale devices. Uh, you don't want to have your payment processing application 
forced to restart because an application was downloaded. Or let's say that you're a school, you don't want the educational applications you're using to be temporarily unavailable because they're updating. So what Do Not Disturb allows you to do is specify time windows when devices will ignore MDM commands to install or update applications and profiles. This will mean that automatically install right outside the window. And if you want to be really granular and specifically say, hey, I want to push these uh, applications and up profiles specifically at 2 a.m. on Tuesday morning, uh, you can do that as well. So just to quickly step you through the workflow, you can first, you'll find this under Systems Manager Configure General, but you can choose to limit applications and or profiles, so whether both or one of them specifically. You'll then schedule when devices should not be interrupted, so you can use the existing schedules that you have or create a new one here. And then, like all things manager, apply the scope using tags. So saying, hey, this only applies to my kiosk devices that are compliant with my security policy, for example. And a sneak peek at some of the features that are currently in beta uh, and coming soon. First is the tags management page, which we're actually in the process of rolling out to uh, dashboards across the board. The tags management page, for those of you that are familiar with Systems Manager, you'll know that tags are critical to functionality Systems Manager. It's what ties applications, profiles, and devices together. You map applications, profiles, uh, to devices with tags. Uh, but prior to this page, there was sort of multiple points for you to review where tags were in use. You could check the clients page, you could check the applications page, you could check the settings page. But there wasn't a place to holistically manage all of your applications, create new tags, edit existing tags, rename them, delete them, uh, until the release of the tags management page. Uh, so in this screenshot here, you can see a list of the tags that are configured in the network, the devices it's applied to, the profiles it's mapped to, as well as the applications it's mapped to. Again, this is in the process of being rolled out, so expect to see this appearing in your dashboard over the next couple weeks. And the final feature that we'll be talking about today is the self-service portal. This has been another huge customer ask uh, because one thing that we're always hearing is we want to reduce the amount of tier zero support tickets that our IT or support department are receiving uh, internally. This includes things like, help, I forgot my passcode, please unlock my device. Help, I lost my device, can you help me find it? Or just, I need this app, can you push down this install command? There's no reason why you need to be contacting the IT administrator to, uh, to run some of these commands. So what self-service portal do, does is actually integrate with our MC uh, self-service portal so that you can manage not just your MC, but also your mobile devices that you're assigned as the owner for and systems manager. You can do things like check the security compliance status and see whether you're meeting or violating any particular policies push and send reinstall commands as well as view which applications you have available that are configured in dashboard without again having dashboard access yourself as an end user. You also gain access to your uh, MDM commands, for example, unlocking device, clearing a passcode. If you happen to have dropped your iPad behind the couch and don't know where it went, put it in lost mode, play a sound, and you'll find that device. This is still in closed beta, so Right now, you're not going to have access to dashboard yet, but be sure to look out for this in the coming quarter. All right, and with that, I will hand it off to James to review our MS switch line. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, hello, my name is James, and I am the switch PMM here at Meraki. Today, we'll be reviewing just a few of the products that we that came out over the last quarter. And to start, uh, we'll begin with our MS120-8. Uh, this is our eight port model, and it features a one gig uplink with PoE and PoE Plus. Uh, the most important feature that we added uh, to this product is that we now offer a low power model. Uh, that means that you can maintain a very small form factor while having your devices powered. So we are very, very excited uh, about the release and orderability of this Layer 2 access switch. 
And moving forward, uh, we have our uh, larger brother of the uh, smaller compact switch. Uh, this is the MS120, and the real difference between this is one is compact and the other one is rack mountable. Uh, this features uh, four 1 gig SFP uplinks and additionally is a layer 2 access switch. And placing uh, those two products within the greater context of our entire access switch line, uh, on the left we see uh, the 120-8 and the 120, uh, but moving on, to, we also hope to have uh, the MS210 available towards the end of the fall. Uh, so with that, I am going to pass it over to June. Hello, everybody. Thank you, James. Um, awesome. So I'm actually the last product, which I'm very excited about, and I'm so glad to hear um, all the updates from all the other products. Um, in the MC world this quarter, we've been focused on call quality optimization. And we say this every time, so you guys might be familiar with this, but call quality is so dependent on the network. And as an IT company, we have the understanding of the network to optimize the MC for all calls and all customers at all bandwidth levels. So that's really what we're trying to do this last quarter and moving forward to make sure that your call quality and experience is the best that it can be. There are a lot of situations where, you know, depending on who's streaming video or how many calls there are, your call quality is going to be affected. And that's why we've developed features such as the call quality graph with in dashboard, oops, uh, which hopefully we'll see. No one? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Awesome. So I'm going to sign into dashboard and just quickly show you guys this. Oh, we don't have, sorry, we're going to quickly do this. And I don't have my password, correct? <laughs> um, my dear colleague, Rachel Lowe, is going to help me instead. And now you guys know that this is a real demo, and we're not doing this uh, pre-recorded. There we go. Awesome. So if you guys haven't seen this before, we've started to release more and more troubleshooting features out to Meraki phones, um, and I will show you in our San Francisco office. So within our phones, phones page, you get a list of all of the phones, like you do with all the other products. But when you go into a single one, and these are our San Francisco offices, so let's take one that I know a lot of people use. There you, go. Um, you get this really great graph of recent packet loss in calls. And you can look a little bit and change the um, date timeline. But the really great thing about this graph, I mean, this isn't a very interesting graph, but the really great thing actually about it is that you can go down to each single call within the call history and actually look at the call quality loss and jitter um, statistics throughout the timeline of the call. So instead of saying, or instead of having a customer call you or a uh, employee call you and say, hey, you know, I had a really bad call. It was, it sounded funny at the beginning. I don't know what happened. You can actually go in and now trace the call quality throughout the entire duration of the call and be aware of it so that you can proactively optimize things if need be. So this is a feature that's been with, uh, been in dashboard, but necessarily um, as utilized or uh, maybe as known about because it is more hidden. But this is something that is indicative of what we're really trying to do with Meraki MC. Um, however, this doesn't mean that we're done. Our software team has been heads down, dedicated to coming up with new and innovative ways to ensure that call quality is great, monitoring is automatic, and troubleshooting is easy. So those are our three core tenets. We want call quality to be great, monitoring to be automatic, and troubleshooting to be easy. However, none of that is really that pretty to look at. So let's take a quick look at some features that have come out in the past um, and have had incremental updates that necessarily haven't been advertised. Oops, and four fingers, there we go. First thing that I want to talk about is our call quality, uh, sorry, excuse me, call group logout. 
And hopefully you guys have known that we've had call groups for a while where you can put a group of into a um, a group of phones, a group of phones together behind a single number where they all ring or ring in a specific strategy once that phone number is called. However, we also heard the feedback from customers that it was important that sometimes if a person was away from their desk or if they were busy, that they were able to selectively opt out of that group. So now you can do call group availability settings where you can choose to do an activity-based logout or an activity-based availability status. So with activity-based logout, users can be auto-logged out when they miss a given number of calls. And with activity-based availability, users, users can be marked unavailable and they won't receive calls for a duration if they've missed or rejected any calls since login. So that gives you a little bit more granular um, control over who gets the call group calls and who is available to pick them up. Moving on, we also have network-wide call parking. And network-wide call, call parking is sometimes also called you know, just normal call parking, um, call hold, or uh, network hold. And this can be enabled within the settings page and dashboard, which is the little um, check mark or switch box. Um, but this is actually what the screen of the phone will look like once you enable it. So once you're on the screen of your phone, you'll be able to see that you have one other call being held on the network, and you can tap to view details. Once you click that, you'll be able to see who is on hold, who put them on hold, and how long they've been on hold. So this is really important. If you have a whole list of people, you'll be able to prioritize them based on who is who has been on hold the longest, or maybe who's the most important, or maybe um, who, you know, maybe the CEO put somebody on hold and you want to make sure that they get answered before um, other people. So you get all of this great visual detail right in the list of the phone screen. And of course, you can also see this when the phone is asleep. So even if it's on your desk sleeping, you'll be able to see it far at the top and you'll be able to attend to your customers or your employees um, as soon as possible. All right, so that's it for features, but I will quickly tease that something very fun and exciting is coming soon, and it will be released on the Meraki blog. So if you guys don't know what the Meraki blog is, I'm gonna quickly show you. And we're going to go to meraki.com, or meraki.cisco.com. Uh, yes, and Emily brings up a really great point that you know we have this new, highly comprehensive post about the crack vulnerability and um, from here, you are going to want to go to products, Rocky blog, and you can read that really great post about the crack vulnerability right here. Look, it's at the top. So convenient for you. Um, but this is actually where we release a lot of features and um, even, I mean, security, thought leadership articles, things that we want our customers to know and things that we think are important for you, as well as this new fun thing that I will be releasing uh, very soon. So if you're curious about that, I highly suggest that you come here and you press subscribe and you enter your email address and um, subscribe to us. Awesome. So I think that's it for all of our products and I will open it up to Q&A. Do you have any questions that people are curious about? <laughs> Thanks very much, Jean. Okay, uh, let's get back to the uh, to the slide. I think uh, June has wrapped things up nicely. Uh, as always with the quarterly, there's uh, so much to update you all on. Hopefully that was a useful uh, update for you. What I'm gonna do now, uh, before we wrap this up and let you get back to your day, uh, we're just gonna have a quick look at some of the questions that have come in. Uh, I'll just share some of those with you. If you do have any last minute questions, now's your opportunity. We've got uh, just a, uh, a few minutes to have a look at some of those that have come in and, and share them with you all. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to go down the Q&A list. If you do have any questions, pop them in the Q&A uh, panel. We'll try and get those answered for you before we wrap things up. Uh, so we had a question come in around the new MX models, 250, 450, asking uh, if there was redundancy available for those. Uh, that's always been a feature of the uh, security appliances for, for now for several years. And so uh, definitely if you go along to our website, documentation.meraki.com, you're going to be able to learn the various ways in which uh, MX uh, MXN, the plural of MX, uh, can be uh, set up in a redundant fashion, either for uh, local area network um, or for uh, the head end, so perhaps at the, uh, at the data center in your head office. 
A uh, very important question came in around orderability on the Z3 because it was not quite ready to order when we announced it as the, and the launch back in September. Uh, but we are happy to announce that that is now available. So we're very happy to uh, uh, get the orders flowing in for Z3, that very cute little box. You know you want one on your desk. Okay, and the question came in around uh, the Azure VMX uh, capacity on that. So the question specifically was around VPN uh, clients or tunnels we can we can handle. Uh, that's not the limitation here. So that's a, just simply a, a logical capability that the uh, devices on both ends are going to be able to cope with as it scales. The limitation really is around throughput. So what we're uh, suggesting is that uh, you keep throughput below 500 megabits per second with however many VPN tunnels you have set up uh, to keep the performance uh, in the flowing nice and nice and uh, nice and fluidly for you. Okay, just scanning down through the questions here. Uh, there was a good tip on the camera for people who want to scrub video backwards and forwards. Uh, I believe numbers two and three on the keyboard will enable you to do that. Did I get that right, Rachel? Backwards and forwards, yes. Okay, not backwards, forwards only. So that enables you to scrub forwards on the uh, on the video. So we had a question around uh, Bluetooth range on the on the APs, really comparable to Wi-Fi range. It's always, of course, very difficult in real-world deployments, and this is why we always recommend uh, surveying whatever technical solution you're putting in place to make sure it does actually perform the way you want it to. In clear space with absolutely no obstacles whatsoever, you can expect up to 100 meters uh, with both the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth on our APs. Okay, I'm just continuing to scrub down the list here. So great question here around uh, Z1 deployment in vehicles for public safety use. And definitely there have been a number of uh, customers who've uh, taken that approach. Cisco itself uh, uses devices like this in its own uh, emergency re uh, response team uh, kits. Uh, and we deployed those uh, recently, uh, certainly for Hurricane Harvey and also for the wildfires here in California. So those kits do con contain Meraki equipment. Uh, the question was specifically around uh, whether Z3 has that same capability as Z1. It's really virtually identical, this box, as the original. So same uh, power adapter, same power source as you had before. Uh, so you'll have no trouble using it for that application. So very good question here around uh, stacking on the MS-210, the switches that are uh, coming up uh, very shortly now. And so you're going to be able to stack those together with the MS-225. Uh, and those obviously, the difference, really key difference between those models is the sort of uplink performance, general performance of those switches. So MS-210 has the one gig uh, fiber uplinks, uh, SFP based versus the SFP plus on the MS-225. Really, what we're trying to do is cover all the various different price points in the market, offering uh, all of these different model options for you, because people do buy uh, a lot of these switches. So definitely worth uh, thinking carefully about what your real-world application will be before you decide which model to go for. Yeah, great question here around uh, availability of the phone uh, outside of the United States and uh, and Canada. Uh, we are working as fast as we can on that. It's actually turned out to be a little bit more involved than we expected with certain uh, geographies and, and countries. It's it's uh, really a very um, advanced technology at this point in time. A lot of IP service providers already in place. 
Uh, and so in order for us to be able to really provide the Meraki-like experience that we want to with MC, uh, we have to really negotiate carefully to make sure that we can integrate that properly into the dashboard. Those of you who use MC in the US, uh, you'll know that part of its main benefit is the fact that you have a degree of service provider integration for access to PSTN built right into the dashboard, meaning you don't have to go off uh, and configure two in two different places. Uh, you have the option to do it all through a single login. And that's really the user experience that we're trying to go for with uh, the Meraki MC. Uh, we will certainly try to get that out to other countries as soon as we can. It's uh, in our best interest to do that as well. Uh, I think one of the very interesting questions around um, voice call quality uh, and how you can monitor that, one of the ways you can do this is with the MX platform. So if you are using MX uh, with your MCs, uh, MX has a great capability enabling you to see uh, mod scores measured on the wide area network links. And so this really enables you to see uh, if you have the kind of throughput that you need to provide great experience when you are calling uh, between locations. So that's definitely worth taking a look at, and that's all bound in the SD-WAN functionality on the MX, which enables us to make a smart decision about which forwarding path to use for our more sensitive traffic like the voice. As always, a lot of questions about what we might do in the future, and I really do appreciate those. Apart from anything else, they give us a good sense of what you're hungry for out there. Uh, Julie up and down at the, uh, at the prospect of producing more phone models for you to, uh, to try out. So we're, of course, looking into, uh, into other options for uh, that product family, so we will announce those as soon as we possibly can. I should just point out with, uh, with VMX, the intent there is not uh, so much for end client connections directly to Azure. This is really for uh, creating site-to-site -site style auto VPN functionality on the MX. So those of you who are used to VPN uh, configuration there, you'll know that these are two different things. Uh, what we're trying to do is provide the same seamless experience around uh, VPN setup that you have today with Meraki to Meraki on the site-to-site -site VPNs. But, but instead of having a, a Meraki box at each end, we have a, essentially a virtual appliance running within those public cloud services. Okay, so um, good question here. Just a simple point of clarification around uh, SFP plus and SFP. Uh, wherever you see ports that are designated as SFP plus, they're going to be able to support uh, both uh, the SFP plus standard 10 gig and SFP at one. Uh, so you don't have to worry about backwards compatibility there if you see that SFP plus designation. Okay, uh, so it looks like we're through the, uh, the majority of the questions that, uh, that I want to share with you all today. Uh, so I think it's time to bring today's quarterly to a close. Uh, it seems like such a short period of time between these quarterlies, but uh, amazing how much we can pack into a single quarter. And we'll be back again at the beginning of January with a fresh update for Meraki. I'd like to thank you all again for taking time out of your day. We know it's precious time uh, to hear those updates. Keep the conversation going with us. Uh, as June said, to do please go along and subscribe on our blog so you can keep up with the very latest from Meraki. And we look forward to welcoming you back on the next quarterly in 2018. Bye-bye for now.